18 percent is the biggest drop in the policy rate since 2014. Addressing journalists at the MPC conference uh, this, uh, this morning, Governor Dr. Ennis Atsin said the move was influenced by the positive outlook of the economy. The continuation of the allotment system, which aligned expenditures to revenues. Growth prospects for 2018 remain positive and are expected to be supported by crude oil production, gradual recovery in non-oil sector, and favorable business and consumer sentiments. The pace of growth in economic activity, as reflected by the latest update in the CIEA, showed some improvements, although still below potential for a number of reasons, including moderated credit growth due to high NPLs, tighter credit conditions, and corrections in the balance sheets of the banking sector. The, dis the disinflation process continued to firm up over the first two months of the year, with significant moderation in price pressures. Both headline and core inflation broadly trended down, alongside easing inflation expectations, an indication that the disinflation process remains well anchored. Our latest forecast suggests that the medium term inflation target of 8 plus or minus 2 percent is within the forecast horizon and we are on course to meeting the inflation target band. The committee noted that the current inflation forecast provides scope for monetary policy to realign interest rates, translate the disinflation gains achieved so far to the market and reinforce the fiscal consolidation process by easing the bedding of interest payments on the budget. Under these circumstances, the committee decided to reduce the monetary policy rate by 200 basis points to 18%. While well, the governor of the central bank has also been speaking about latest developments in the banking sector to do with the takeover of Unibank. I'm not sure if he was very clear on what he wanted, because obviously if they met the capital requirement, we would not have liquidated those two banks. So they, they did not meet the capital requirements and they were deeply insolvent, if you remember, it was negative over a hundred or something percent. So those banks were completely in very, very bad shape. So now the question from City Banks that I had said that when I took over there were nine banks that were, you know, having difficulties. I went back to that issue because I think it's important to stress that what we are seeing is a legacy problem. Right? So that's why we always go back to the nine banks. It's not us who came and created those nine banks. We came to meet it. So this is a legacy problem, and a legacy problem arising from so many factors, including the weak economic management. That's part of the legacy problem. So yes, there were nine banks. Two had to be uh, liquidated. One has been put into administration. And I've just given you the latest date of, of the banking system that we think that it's robust. We think that the resilience is improving. I also talked about the fact that the capital adequacy ratios are going up. So there's some effort. The banks are, are putting in additional effort to raise their capital. That includes the banks that have not been, you know, acted on. Obviously, they must be the ones that are contributing to the increasing resilience that, that we, are, we are seeing. All right, so let's get you some more perspective, especially to do with the drop in the policy rate to 18%. Speaking earlier on the marketplace, economists with Data Bank, Karajmata, explained the effect of the special petroleum tax and other developments within the petroleum industry may have contributed to the significant drop in the policy rate. If you recall, in February, the government amended the special petroleum tax from ad valorem to specific tax. Sure. What it meant was that whenever price of crude oil goes up on the world market and it translates into higher export prices, the higher 
effect will be mitigated by the spe specific tax. Otherwise, it could have been more. So the specific tax makes sure that the impact is minimized. Then in March, you recall again that the PURC reduced electricity tariff for different categories of consumers. Mm. This also meant that the cost pressures will further be contained going forward because electricity tariff for utilities are key components of the inflation mm. measure. And so you see that the outlook is very, very favorable now for lower inflation. Of course, the city is also quite stable, mm -hmm. very strong in recent months against expectations. And all this just means that the inflation outlook is very much improved and it gives scope for the central bank to cut the policy rate because we need to do that because if you look at the composite index of economic activity, it shows that the economic activity is picking up by still running below potential. I think the, the central bank is moving swiftly. And for me, on the contrary, it should give more confidence to the investors that we have a regulator that is not prepared to wait for things, the problems to degenerate. And so the sweetness with which they are moving should give so much confidence to the market. And of course, let me also emphasize that at the start of this asset quality review and when all these problems started coming up and they identified nine banks as the ones at risk, there was an emphasis on the fact that these smaller banks mm. account for less than 5% of the total industry portfolio, deposit portfolio. Okay. And that basis, when things like this happen, it shouldn't give us the concern that our banking sector is not stable because the guys that are at risk, the central bank says they account for just 5% or less of the industry's deposit portfolio. So it tells you that they are being ring fenced so that they would not be transmitted into other areas. So the larger population of the banking sector is still strong. And that was uh, economist Karaj Mati also touching on the developments in the banking sector. Well, now South Africa says it did not sign the Continental Free Trade Agreement because it needed more time to study the agreement. The country was also concerned about the huge influx of people into that country instead of goods after it fully commits. So far, the two big economies in Africa, Nigeria and South Africa, are not signatories to the Continental Free Trade Agreement. Initialed in Rwanda, the Deputy South African High Commissioner to Ghana, Tapela Madubani, revealed this at the Ghana South African Chamber of Commerce breakfast meeting in Accra. South Africa is the first among three other countries in Africa to be labeled as upper middle class countries. The country's economy alone accounts for 35% of Africa's GDP. Based on statistics, it was expected that South Africa would have been a major player in the Continental Free Trade Agreement signed last week in Rwanda. Deputy Ambassador to Ghana, Thape Madubani, has been explaining why his country declined. Well, South Africa, you will be aware, has made one of the biggest food factors in Africa. But uh, that is not on its own. It's not something that we say, ah, no, 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 because we have a poor factor, and we suspect that we, we will be overwhelmed by people. And all, no. all that we're doing is to take the agreement back home, democratically engage people, inform them what the CFTA is all about, um, because we have industries, we have uh, unions, we have people must be consulted. And remember, signing an agreement, how many agreements have been signed and never went into force? It will be useless to sign an agreement which you will not then ratify because you did not consult your people. He was speaking the Ghana South Africa Chamber of Commerce breakfast meeting. In a related development, the South African Deputy Ambassador reacted to a recent development where the FDA destroyed a quantity of meat products imported into the country from South Africa. He assured meat from the country is wholesome. You know that those other brands have not been controlled by the bacteria, uh, which happens naturally, uh, but uh, Unfortunately, in that particular meat processing plant, which has since been uh, suspended operations, uh, the, the, the programs there have been recalled off the shelves 
and they are not being made right now. So I can assure you that um, my government is moving at pace um, to make sure, to double check and make sure that uh, we arrest this situation. A director in charge of export at the Ministry of Trade, Ibo Kwesen, noted government has selected 80 companies to benefit from the stimulus package expected to revive collapsing Ghanaian companies. The paramount chief of Isikado traditional area, Nana Kobnan Ketia, is challenging insurance brokers to re-strategize towards digitization of the insurance sector in order to remain relevant as consumer behavior becomes more sophisticated and fast-tracked through technology. He says insurance and reinsurance brokers have no alternative than to adapt. He was speaking at a three-day annual conference and exhibition organized by the Ghana Insurance Brokers Association in Takrade. Bismarck Awusa took part in the conference and files the following report. The fifth annual conference and exhibition brought together over 150 executives and senior managers of insurance brokerage firms, general and life insurance companies, and reinsurance companies to discuss how they can leverage digital innovation to remain relevant on the market. In a keynote address, Paramount Chief of Isikado Traditional Area, Nana Kobina Nketia, challenged brokers to devise new ways in the face of technology to meet demands of their clients in order to sustain their business. Part of the consideration may have been to equip up its members to proactively evolve their operations to catch up with the changing trends in the business uh, environment. But then one may ask the question, should brokers be worried? Yes, because changes come. These are disruptions and innovations are taking place, and brokers may soon find their traditional role being taken over, being taken over Institutes and fin uh, fintechs. Change is happening and it will catch up or overtake you. Another major question, Mr. Chair, is that how fast are we aligning ourselves and adapting to the changes that are taking place around us before our intermediary role loses its relevance? Meanwhile, President of Giba, Lena Edukofi, is optimistic. Digitization can remove some loopholes, including double insurance in the industry. With the low level of insurance penetration in the country, the main industry players have greater responsibility of educating majority of Ghanaians and also marketing our various products and services, leaving us with no option than to go digital, a new marketplace. For example, is it not possible for us to develop an app that has short codes to help us to check the double insurances and also to authenticate driver's licenses? We have no doubt that going digital is the way forward. On his part, Commissioner of Insurance Justice Yao Ofori described the situation where a large percentage of insurance products are not ready automation. for automation. A Deloitte study on tech trends for insurance review that insurance businesses realize the need to be more efficient and accessible in order to serve today's policy holder. However, while 63% of insurance businesses report their readiness to move towards more digital practices, only 23% of these businesses are actually ready. Digital transformation goes beyond scanning a document with your phone and sending it via WhatsApp to your clients or receiving a picture or a damaged vehicle via WhatsApp or email. The three-day conference and exhibition was under the theme Embracing Digital Transformation and Innovation in Insurance Business. Turning to one of our top stories tonight, the country's debt stock has reached 142 billion Ghana cities. Figures released by the Bank of Ghana showed that in just a month, from November to December 2017, the debt number shot up by 3.5 billion cities. But why are these numbers increasing despite all the programs being implemented to reduce the debt stock? There's more in this report. 
The reports show that the debt numbers are still going up significantly, despite assurances by government that the numbers would be going down or the rate of increase would reduce because of several policy measures being instituted. Loans secured from outside stood at $17 billion, representing more than half of the total debt stock, while domestic was 66.7 billion cities. For some, the fact that the debt-to-GDP ratio has also reached the 70% mark raises a lot of questions about its impact on our ability to pay debts back on time or being classified as high risk of debt distress. The data released by the central bank also showed that the country's export earnings appears to increase with February numbers at $2.8 billion, which is $2 million more than the same period last year. On the banking sector, the reports show that all is not well in terms of growth in all the indicators, while stock of non-performing loans is still going up. Well, Deputy Minister of Information Kojo Ponkuma has been speaking to this. He says things could have been worse if government had not put in measures to contain the debt situation so far. He spoke to my colleague, George Yaffe. The government introduced two key measures in the debt management program. One, to reprofile the old debt so that its cost and its refinancing risk will be reduced. So what you have seen in some of the instances is that we have swapped cheaper, longer dated debt for expensive, shorter dated debt. The impact is that in the future on our fiscal tables, how much money we have to spend on debt servicing will not go up by the projected amount because now we've swapped it for cheaper debt. What that means is that it will create more space for us to spend on the priorities of government. And on that side, today, if you notice, the rates for the, uh, you know, shorter data treasury bills are all falling because government is no longer demonstrating an appetite for it and is um, literally retiring um, those ones. So the reprofiling has worked. And we have always mentioned that the reprofiling will not add to our debt stock. Now, the second thing that government also sought to do was a combined strategy of reducing the rate at which we are accumulating debt, reducing the deficit, and at the same time, introducing measures that push the GDP up. So that at the end of the day, when you have a lower debt growth figure, the debt stock will not grow by as much as it was traditionally growing. We are slowing down the rate at which the debt stock has been growing, and we are growing the GDP faster. So that is why now when you do the debt to GDP ratio, it has dropped to 69.8%. Our hope is to do more of it so that we can get to a medium term target, hopefully about 65%. What do you think for, for the layperson on the street, he wants to look at the nominal numbers and ask himself, why am I not seeing that significant reduction in the nominal numbers? In the debt stock, you mean? Yeah. And we have to help the layperson by understanding that if my salary is four million and I owe three million, I am at a risk of debt distress. But even if my debt goes up by two hundred cities and now I owe three point two million, but my salary now goes up to ten million or fifteen million, I am no longer at a risk of debt distress. And that is why the economists never just limit the conversation to the debt stock. But they always say it is measured by the debt to GDP ratio, because that is what compares your debt stock and what it has been used for. And that is why they say that when you cross the 70% threshold, then it means that the debt you're accumulating is really not generating enough GDP, and therefore you are at a risk of distress. In this case, if you compare the two, we have come down from 73.3%, now down to 698 and we're hoping to take it down a bit further. So if you ask me about the layman, I'll say our challenge is to get the layman to understand that actually the debt sustainability graph is improving, it's coming down. That was the Deputy Information Minister reacting to concerns about the country's rise in debt. And well, as we've been reporting tonight, the policy rate is down by a significant margin to 18%, a drop uh, of 200 basis points. We want to break down the trend for you, monitoring how um, it has panned out from January 2017. Take a look at this.
right, so there you have it. And to have a discussion around this, I'm joined in the studio by Bertha Atubika. Of course, she's got the latest on the stock market, but quite a significant announcement made today, 18%. It's, it's, it's very significant. What's going to be the impact on the stock market, do you think? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we know that uh, the interest rates in the stock markets are inversely related to mm. some extent. So with this, um, the monetary policy rate coming down by 200 basis points to 18%, definitely we're going to see that um, impact the stock market positively. And we know the stock market has been bullish for some time now um, on the market. We've seen um, it return positively to investors, though we recorded mm. some declines in some past weeks and it started picking up from last two weeks Friday. You've seen the market go up positively. And now what, what's going to happen is that um, with this coming down, uh, the banks will also be expected to reduce their lending rates as like giving me money at 18%. But is 18%. This something they would do? Well, I mean, it needs to be yeah. um, enforced, okay, because um, the government is actually doing this so that um, the people in the economy, businesses can actually borrow from the banks to do businesses at a relatively lower rate than what they are expecting now so that they can expand. And when they expand, the economy expands as well, and the government tends to benefit in a form of some forms of taxes that they'll be taking from these businesses. But this is a situation where most banks or some banks are still charging very high lending rates. Um, listen, now the bank, bank of Ghana is going to give it to you at 18%, uh, and then you give it to me close to about 30%. It isn't fair. So it needs to be enforced to make sure that the banks also reduce their lending rates so that businesses can borrow from the banks and do it. Well, I was speaking to an economist. And you know, yeah. you know when, when interest rates are very high, when these lending rates are very high, that's what results in high NPOs of most of the banks their non-performing loans actually goes up because they're not able to get back most of the funds that are given out as loans. Because the rates at which um, the interest that's charged on these loans are very high mm. and most businesses end up defaulting. They're not able to pay back as expected by these banks. Okay. I was actually going to say, I was speaking to an economist who thought that the banks right now would not have justification for keeping the lending rates high Definitely. but of course we would, we would have a look at that in the coming days mm, it needs how, to be enforced. <laughs> how are the stocks faring today i okay. mean you indicated that there's been an improvement from the last, last couple week, yeah. yes last two weeks friday we've seen the market show up consistent uh, consistently and beginning this week we saw that continue the stock market went up uh, the composite index went up marginally by 0.15 percent but we saw the uh, financial stock index actually decrease by 0.03 percent by close of today mm. and that was because we had some big giant equities losing on their previous share prices assets bank ecobank and then standard chartered bank lost 0.85 0.36 percent and then 0.03 percent on their opening prices by close of day we okay. had seven equities actually gaining as compared to the uh, three losers that we saw on the market but most of these equities were not within the financial um, financial and banking equities are listed on the stock market we had go we had BOPP we had Unilever uh, we had um, EGL total so we had only two financial equities making way into the seven gainers that we had today on the market and that was EGL and then uh, Societe General appreciated by 0.95 percent for Societe General and EGL went up by 0.21 percent by close of today. All right thank you Bertha to You're begin with the latest on the stock market. We are moving on to our interview of the day. The Ghana Revenue Authority has indicated it will go ahead with the strict enforcement of the tax down policy from June this year this is despite admitting that it has had some problems in ensuring that businesses comply with the policy. There are fears that the full implementation of the tax stamp would be extended again following reports that some businesses are having challenges in affixing the stamps on their products. But uh, Commissioner General Kofi T thinks otherwise. Yes, we are going on the strict compliance of the SIS tax stamp. The, the industry with the high speed, we're having some challenges, we're in communication with them to resolve them. But as far as we are concerned, it's a way to go. If you recall, I was saying that uh, as of 2010, we we're getting like 3.4 billion, 3.4 percent of the tax collection in the excise. But then it had fallen to 1.8 percent as of 2017. And so there, with that drop, basically it was behalved. And we need to do something about it. And the, that area had a lot of leak, uh, leakage. And my you, the SI tax stamp is one to get us revenue, but above revenue to get us to consume products which are health-wise good for us. 
to, it was to eliminate illicit and counterfeit products. And, for, and when you look at a system where people are having kidney problems and the rest, it's because of this proliferation of bad medicines and the rest. So that if we have a size stand stamp on it, the Ghana Standards Authority would have approved of the product. And our people may be con uh, consuming good products. So for me, as a, a, a former WHO person, I'm for it because it's more for the health of the people than anything. Thank you.